Friends and supporters, thank you for being with us for E Pluribus Unum and our signature luncheon. We appreciate you turning out. I am Tony Benut. Many of you know me. I'm the Vice President of Institutional Advancement at IFYC. Uh, and it's my honor to get things started this afternoon. As I'm sure most of you know, IFYC works tirelessly to help colleges and universities turn religious diversity into a positive a uh, positive force, not just on campus, but throughout society, uh, and to support the interfaith leadership of over 1,300 IFYC alumni. Many of them are here today, and you'll have the chance to meet them before we are through this afternoon. Currently, over 400 campuses have deeply incorporated interfaith cooperation into their programming. That ranges from student leadership to campus life to faculty curricular work to the highest levels of strategic planning and campus visioning. We are very proud to play a partnership role in supporting and in catalyzing this movement. America's positive engagement of our religious diversity has always been important. In fact, IFYC thinks it's woven into the American story that we've inherited, and it's incumbent on us to contribute to the, the writing of the next chapter of that story. But you don't need me to tell you that in this American moment, it is critically important. You are all part of a movement that strengthens our nation at a time that is strained. Thank you. I'd like to express a special thank you to the sponsors of today's luncheon, uh, Hogendorn and Talbot, um, who are here with us. Case Hogendorn has been a, a friend of IFYC for a number of years, actually uh, in a literal sense before IFYC existed which sounds maybe theological or cosmic. Um, but Case was involved with Good City when, before IFYC was incorporated as a 501c3, uh, Good City was our fiscal sponsor, enabled us to receive our first grant back in 2002 from the Ford Foundation. Uh, Park Piedmont Advisors joins Hogan, Dorn, and Talbot as sponsors of today's luncheon. Tom Levinson is here with Park Piedmont. Uh, Tom has been a great friend and colleague in this work, serves as IFYC's general counsel, over the years has offered fantastic support in guiding us through different challenges that uh, any organization faces in successive stages of growth. Thank you. I also wanna say thank you to the, uh, the many Impact 2020 uh, anchor investors who are here and dialing in remotely. Uh, these are folks that are undergirding and supporting our current business phase. There are President's Council supporters in the room. There are foundation partners in the room. There are actually folks that are dialing in and viewing us on webcast. Um, I know there's folks from San Francisco, from New York, from Boston, not just those major US cities, but also Moorhead, Minnesota, Story City, Iowa, Moscow, Kentucky, Moscow, Idaho, and that Moscow as well. We have a former intern who's dialing in from Russia, where I hear the harvest moon has ascended, uh, and it's late in the evening. Um, finally, before I turn things over to our chair, I want to take a moment just to recognize that we gather on the first day of Sukkot. Uh, many of our Jewish friends and colleagues are celebrating. We wish you a wonderful and meaningful celebration. Um, and we're glad that many of you could join us. With that, please join me in welcoming the chair of IFYC's board of directors, my friend and colleague, Brad Henderson. All right. Thank you everyone for coming. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, uh, so just a couple of quick comments before we get started. Uh, as Tony mentioned, there's so many people to thank uh, for being here today, but I particularly want to thank uh, all the members of the Board of Directors. It is a fantastic group of people to work with who spend a lot of time uh, doing whatever they can to help this great organization, and so I just wanted to, to, to thank you in advance. Uh, the other thing is uh, you may have seen uh, that as a uh, token of our gratitude for you all coming today, we have a, a copy of John's book. Uh, and so, uh, I, a couple of quick comments. So first, in the spirit of you cannot judge a book by its cover, although I think it's a, a beautiful cover, today we get to judge it in two different ways. The first is we actually get to hear from John, which was way better and more exciting than just looking at the cover. Uh, and the second is um, you can also uh, call attention and judge the bookmark. And so this bookmark, we're so happy for you all to have. Uh, please use it as a bookmark. But very importantly, you'll notice 
uh, that it's also a, a pledge. Uh, and uh, I, I think the subtle way of saying it is we'd be happy to provide you with a second bookmark uh, if you'd like to use the foot, foot first bookmark for any other uh, reasons. Um, so I wanted to briefly share two reflections uh, in uh, personal reflections in my board chair role to set the stage for the conversation today. So the first one is professional. So in my professional life, I'm a senior partner at the Boss Consulting Group. And as we think about solving very difficult problems. We think there are two components um, to solving the world's most difficult problems. And clearly, issues of interfaith is one of those um, challenges or problems. The first is uh, the softer side of change. How do you really inspire a vision uh, and get people motivated to make a difference, whether it's a company or a not-for-profit organization or a country? And the second is the harder side of change. Making the work happen takes nitty-gritty real work. We, our, our, let's think about it, our space program as a country is so good, A, because we had the vision to put somebody on the moon, but we also have NASA, NASA Mission Control uh, Center. And what makes me so excited to partner with IFYC is I actually think it's one of those very inspiring not-for-profits that gets both of those right. So the vision that they set and the way they articulate their view brings me to tears nearly every time I hear it. But if you're able to see underneath the hood and see the rigor in the intellect, in the commitment to driving change, much as a serious corporation or a leading a civic institution would do, it's truly inspiring. And so for that, I'm excited every day to share my time and energy to help this fantastic organization. And the second one, very briefly, is a personal uh, bit. Um, and, and it's a reminder to me, for all of us, that there are interfaith leaders everywhere. It doesn't have to be uh, at the Gleacher Center in Chicago uh, it can be in a classroom or in a hospital um, or wherever else it might be. And so in this case, the, the inspiration and the surprise message I had is, uh, is deeply personal. Um, so uh, this spring, my mom passed. And when she passed, I spent a lot of my time reflecting on uh, what her life meant to me and my family. She was a school teacher of 35 years uh, in southwestern Ohio. And I thought I'd cracked the code on everything that her life meant to me, and she was my best friend and my source of inspiration. And it was actually in rereading some of Ibu's work and reading John's book uh, that I had a very different reflection um, that is energizing me today and trying to get me to do more. And that is my mom as interfaith leader, and I never thought of this before. And John's book was the big trigger for this. So my, I grew up in a town where about 80% of the population was some combination of uh, Christian, conservative, evangelical. And my mom was a blue dog Democrat from Pittsburgh who screamed with joy every time Michelle Obama was on MSNBC. Uh, and she was screaming all day long. Uh, and, and what I hadn't realized was that for 35 years as a choir teacher uh, in, in Loveland City Schools in Southwestern Ohio, that my mom did not um, did not think anything but positives about the religious and political backgrounds that her students brought into school every day. In fact, it was a source of joy for her. It was a source of difference. And, and to me, as we think about the role we play in making everyone an interfaith leader, to me there's no better uh, uh, vision than the most Michelle Obama biggest groupie fan in the world uh, having people of very different religious convictions singing the Battle Hymn of Republic together uh, year on year and year. And so I hope we all find ways in our own life, uh, whether it's with friends or family, to try to uh, live up to some of those uh, possibilities. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce our panel. And their bios are in the um, materials. Uh, so please read. We're very lucky to have uh, three uh, very distinguished uh, thinkers on this topic. So first is uh, Katie Brigman Baxter. Uh, who is the Vice President of uh, IFYC's um, uh, program strategy, and an amazing professional at driving this work across our campuses. Uh, Ibu Patel, uh, who is the Founder and President of IFYC, and very excitedly, John, uh, who is the Sally D. Danforth, Danforth Distinguished Professor of Law and Religion at Wash U uh, in St. Louis. A real pleasure to have you today. Thank you.
right. Good afternoon, all. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon. In particular, John, it's a real pleasure to, to have you here with us. Um, I shared with you at lunch, Ibu talks about you a lot um, and has appreciated the personal relationship he's had with you. Um, but what he may or may not have shared that folks in this room may or may not know, IFYC um, is an admirer of your work, of course, and um, all of our staff uh, read the, the introduction to confident pluralism in a required core content seminar that we have. So as we are thinking about the work that IFYC is doing in the world, we draw very directly from this text. And so we are really excited to hear from you directly and have you in conversation with Ibu Great. here today. Thank you. Um, and it, looking forward to hearing some of the questions that the folks in the room have as well. I'm going to ask you in a moment to speak to the, the title of the book specifically. But before we do that, we'll take some cues from Brad. And we'd love to hear from the two of you a little bit personally to start. So many folks in this room know Ibu well, but many, many folks maybe have not met you before. And we're just getting to know you, John. So in light of your premise in the book, so in, in, in the introduction, you describe, you describe the text as an argument for mutual respect and coexistence. And you simultaneously point out what you call deep and often irresolvable differences over questions of politics, religion, and sexuality. So tell us a little bit about how your personal story, um, some of your own views, or um, own at some of the own aspects of your identity, which, which you tell us a little bit out, about in the book. Um, how does who you are personally inform or intersect this work? Yeah, thanks. It's a great question. I'll, I'll start with, uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to be with Ibu. I also mentioned Ibu and IFYC quite a bit, Kurt, when I was at your campus recently. Ibu's name came up, and so it's great to partner with you and, and IFYC. It's a privilege to be here. You know, on the, on the personal question, I, I think about it maybe in terms of having some life experiences where I'm often in places where I'm thinking, I am not one of you. I like a lot of who you are, but I'm different in some really important ways. I, and I want to figure out how to, how to be in your world, but not necessarily be completely in your world, and, and how do we work on friendship and relationships. So three quick examples of that. As a, as a Christian, and I, I would have used the word evangelical 10 years ago. That word has gotten harder for me. Uh, but as someone who is on the board of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and a tenured faculty member at Wash U, I'm often in these conversations at Wash U where I look at my faculty and I think, my faculty colleagues, and I think, I am not one of you. And you really don't, you're not, you're making, you have some assumptions about me, you, you really don't know who I am, but I wanna, I wanna fix that. I want you to get to know who I am and some of the differences. And I go to my church sometimes uh, as a half white, half Japanese, person and in a largely white church and I think you know what I am I share a lot of your values but I'm not completely one of you either and some of your assumptions that you make as a very majority white institution you're not realizing how they're affecting me uh, I am motivated by my own family history my grandparents were locked up in the internment camps and my father was born in the camps and so I'm always uh, on a personal level, suspicious of some things that a lot of people take for granted, maybe. Uh, and then the third example, I, I, I was four years active duty military. I was on, in the Pentagon on September 11th. Uh, but I was also deeply influenced by a Christian pacifist theologian. And so I look to my military friends and I think, I am not one of you. I deeply admire much of what you do, but I'm also not one of you. And, 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 but I want to work on what relationship looks like. So those practical experiences, which are, to be honest, exhausting in the aggregate, but also a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ibu, how about you? You write a lot about being the son of an immigrant Indian Muslim family. How do the concepts from confident pluralism intersect with your life? Right. So uh, your, your story, John, reminds me of the great line from Walt Whitman. Uh, he says, do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am wide. I contain multitudes, right? And we all do, right? We all have these many, many worlds within us. Is this on? Uh, so, okay, there we go. So, um, 
I just quoted Walt Whitman, which I will repeat again for those in the back because it's a very good quote. John's story reminds me of a great Walt Whitman line. Uh, uh, do, I con do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am wide. I contain multitudes, right? And uh, I guess, you know, all of us do, right? And we still have to, we still have to kind of form something of a coherent story out of our lives. And one of the stories that I've kind of formed out of my life and experience is, is the ways in which people from other religious backgrounds and inspirations have been such an important influence in my life. In fact, it's the reason that I'm in this country, right? My, my dad likes to point out that it was, uh, it, it was because uh, a Catholic institution founded by Holy Cross priests from France somehow found fit to admit into their MBA program in 1975 this wayward Muslim from India, that man would be my father, that, that the Patel family is in this country, right? And my dad would keep on saying, Notre Dame was founded as an institution to form young Catholics into the faith. There is nothing that required them to admit me, right? Something about the American landscape allows people from particular backgrounds to plant the, the inspiration of their identity in American soil and grow institutions that serve the common good. I think that that's really, really inspiring. There's, for example, 230 Catholic universities in the United States. You could probably count on one hand the number of Catholic universities that only admit Catholic students. By and large, these are institutions with a Catholic identity and ethos which view their principal mission as serving the common and public good because they are Catholic, right? So that has been formational for me. And I actually have a kind of a story at an Notre Dame football game which, which encapsulates some of that. So, you know, my dad barely, barely skated by at Notre Dame, you know, a, a gentleman C kind of thing, probably a gentleman C minus, um, uh, de developed a fierce devotion to fighting Irish football in the process, which is what I think he really majored in, and would bring his, his, uh, his two sons on autumn Saturday afternoons to Notre Dame Stadium, you know, take the Skyway out of Chicago onto I-80 and keep us busy in the car in the land before iPhones by saying, you can see the Golden Dome through the fields if you look really hard, that worked for two hours back then, right? <laughs> but none work anymore. And our first stop would always be at the Grotto, which is the shrine to the Virgin Mary at Notre Dame. And by the time I was 10 or 11, I had a little bit of, of, of Muslim knowledge in my head, and I wanted to get to the stadium faster. I didn't really like this Grotto ritual, which by the way, was probably the only time I ever saw my dad pray <laughs> was in front of the degree is not a particularly ritualistic Muslim, right? But he would cup his hands and say Arabic prayers in front of the grotto. Now, one day I was like, you know, Dad, in my religious education class, we're learning that um, Muslims, Muslims, we don't believe in icons or, or images or, or, or statues. And we can't stand in front of this, this thing with that statue here. We should go straight to the stadium, right? <laughs> and my, my dad, uh, stunningly to me, quotes from the Quran. And he says, Ibu, in the Quran, it says that God is like a lamp in a niche. He is like light upon light. And he points at these thousand flickering candles in the cove that is the grotto. And he says, light upon light. And then he goes back to cupping his hands and closing his prayer, closing his eyes and Arabic prayer. And then he opens his eyes and he puts his hand on and he says, you know, you can look for the differences or you can look for the resonances. I've, I've always thought it's better to look for the resonances, mm. right? Mm. So I love that about your story also, that with your WashU colleagues, at your church, there's always going to be areas of difference and disagreement. What do we choose to pay attention to? What energy do we choose to build on? That doesn't solve the disagreement. It just means the disagreement doesn't cancel the opportunity for relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. It's a great segue back. Um, John, we would love to hear you talk a little bit about the, the topic of the book. Maybe you start, uh, start by telling us about the title. What does confident pluralism mean? Where does the term come from? And give us a sense of what it looks like in practice. Great. So the, uh, the premise of the book is really 
we, we start with the reality by naming the reality of the deep and painful differences we have. And maybe both of those terms are important. They're deep and they're painful, and we're not going to resolve them. And, and I think too often we have situations where for the sake of some kind of feigned unity, we, we forget about the differences. So it's, a, it's an invitation to take the differences seriously. And by the two words, confident and pluralism, I mean that we, ha we have to have confidence enough to say that the differences are there and they matter, but we have to recognize that the pluralism means that we have the reality of politics. And if we forget the reality of politics, but have too much confidence, we're going to end up suppressing difference at the extreme level with violence or with majoritarian rule. And so to hold intention, both the confidence and the pluralism. And then the origin of the term, which I kind of stumbled upon, but I, I was excited about when I, when I found it. In, in 2012, there was a Supreme Court decision involving uh, a law student organization at Hastings College of the Law in California. And the issue was whether the Christian group, with its particular membership requirements, which were exclusionary uh, in a number of ways, whether you were Christian, whether you believed in their same sexuality code, uh, whether they could be part of this public university campus student forum. And there was a brief in the <coughs> case filed by a group called Gays and Lesbians for Individual Liberty. And that group said, basically, we disagree with everything about this Christian group. We don't like what, they're, what they stand for. We don't like their arguments. But we think they absolutely have a right to be in this forum because that's what we're about as a public school campus. That's what this country is about. And so they use the phrase, and this is what it means to have a confident pluralism in our society. Justice Alito picks up on the phrase in his dissent and quotes from that brief using the, using the term. And then it just sort of, sort of sits there. And, no one picked, and, and so I was, as I was working on the early stages of the book, I came across the case and the phrase. And I thought, this is actually capturing both in the descriptive terms, but also in its origins, the kind of argument I'm trying to make. And so that's where it, that's where it comes from. Great. Well, thank you. Um, uh, it, I'm interested in putting the, the topic of the book in conversation with our topic for today. Uh, so the e pluribus unum, the, the theme that, that guides our gathering today. I'm wondering um, if you could speak to resonances and perhaps any points of tension between the two concepts. In the mm -hmm. book, you, you talk about something that you call a modest unity, which perhaps is somewhat different or distinct from e pluribus unum and what I would say the kind of the grand narrative of pluralism that IFYC talks about and aspires to in our work. Yeah, so this, maybe you start and then I'd love to hear Ibu comment This is great. And this might have well. some of the differences of where, although we have a lot of overlapping mm -hmm. intersection, we might have some differences as well. I think by modest unity, I'm trying to say we have to have something that we can all share. Uh, and it has to be more than we all care about roads that run across the states. There has to be something thicker than that. But what is it? It actually gets very hard to name. So someone uh, a few minutes ago mentioned the term common good. I'm actually not sure we can name the common good of the country with any specificity today. We disagree about things like human flourishing, the purpose of the nation, our, our role in the global <laughs> political narrative. and. And those are big, big questions. So I, the, the common good, I mean, from my own tradition, it's a deeply theological and important concept. And I, I think it's important for Christians to keep naming that term as a description of reality. But I'm not sure politically that term can do a lot of work. And so short of the common good, what might our modest unity look like? And that's a, that's a hard question, but it's an urgent question. One thing that makes it harder in the context of pluralism is demographic changes where we not only are more religiously pluralistic, but now we have a, a growing segment of the population that rejects transcendent belief altogether. And that's, that's a particular political challenge that we haven't encountered before. So in the 90s, when people were talking about religious pluralism and how do Catholics, Muslims, and Protestants, and Jews get along, there was, a, there was an appeal to transcendent values, and there was a common, kind of a common entry point into the discussion. And the growing number of atheists and agnostics and others who would not be part of that faith narrative makes it, there has to be a new conceptualization of the resources of pluralism that I think we're still working to figure out. But to your question, unless we get to naming with some specificity what that modest unity looks like, then we're going to be struggling awfully hard for the kind of narrative that can bring us together into the e pluribus unum. Right. So, so yeah. you just tossed a hard question. Now you expect me to do something with it. Or you can right. punch. You can send it back You're to Katie. You're looking at me expectantly. Um, so I, 
by the way, th those, uh, one of the questions IFYC always gets is what do we do with atheists, secularists, humanists, et cetera? And I'm like, oh, you mean the dozen that are on our staff, right? <laughs> and what's, what is interesting about that, I think, is that, and I think that this is maybe, um, uh, there's something distinctively American about this, not uniquely, but distinctively, right? That, that uh, America, that, that you, the, the one dimension of philosophy that America invents is pragmatism, which as my friend Noah likes to say is, is, is easily defined as the truth, the truth is what works, mm -hmm. right? So if IFYC <coughs> had to articulate a narrative of how evangelical Christians and secular humanists could be part of the same organization together before they actually work together on the same staff, we would probably, it would probably have been incomplete. But April Mendez Kunzi and Chris Dedman became fast friends and worked on a lot of programs together, right? So I'm actually really interested in those ethnographic moments, right? And, and my guess is, and this is happening, you know, Northwestern Hospital is what? six blocks from here. And there are people who disagree on every abstract principle of the common good who are saving lives right there right now, right? So if you were to sit them down in kind of a political philosophy way or an abstract principle way and say, would you stipulate to A, B, C, D, and E, be a set of things that'd be like, no, we can't do that. And yet they are engaged in activity X, Y, and Z together, right? So I'm really interested in that. And uh, so, one of the things that I think about is, is, I hope this doesn't offend anybody when I say this, but I think the worst person in America is Jerry Springer, right? And I will tell you why. I actually I get heated when I talk about this. Because every single person on his show is in spaces <coughs> where they are kind and, way, and where they are familial and where they are warm and where they are generous. And Jerry Springer creates a space where they are their worst selves, and I can't stand it. Right? So what does it look like to the absolute opposite? What are the kinds of spaces where people who disagree deeply cooperate? And I guess I'm more interested in that in, in what is still a philosophical sense, right? but the American pragmatic sense of when does it happen? How do we create it more often? How do you then extract principle from that? Right? As opposed to the other way around. How do you act your way into new forms of thinking, which is my sense of how most people go about things, right? as opposed to believing that we have to think our way, principle our way into new ways of acting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I respond? Please. So I, I love a lot of that and share a lot of that vision. As I sometimes put it, we have to be able to find common ground even when we don't agree on the common good. And it's those common ground experiences, especially at the local level, that allow for meaningful relationship across difference. So I, I'm completely on board with that. I, I, think it's, I think it's harder still at the national vision casting level to do that kind of work. The problem with pragmatism is it can't really name the good. And w with an inability to name the good, it's hard to name values toward the good. I think actually American higher, higher ed in general is, is facing a similar challenge. So I don't think that it all means you, we give up on exactly what you're talking about, but it might even put a higher premium on the kinds of things you're talking about. So, because I'm a geek, I can't help but respond to that, right? <laughs> well, because I'm a lawyer, you're sure to get a response to your, whatever you say. So. <laughs> um, I, I think this is what we, uh, you know, William Blake famously said, you see the world in a grain of sand, right? So you take an action and you universalize from that action. So I'll tell, I'll tell a brief story about this. So, you know, the, the way we talk about America as a Judeo-Christian country, we talk about it as if God gave that to Moses on Sinai, right? That was a joke. That was a theological joke. <laughs> Paul Nitter got that back there. <laughs> but in other words, we think it was part of the origin, right? We think it was like, div actually, America as a Judeo-Christian country is a civic invention of the 1930s, not even of 1776. It was created by a set of people, largely in the aftermath of the KKK 1920s and the Al Smith campaign in 1928, where 
the first Catholic who becomes the, a candidate for a major part of the Democratic Party in 1928, his candidacy goes down in a set of anti-Catholic flames. And a group of what we would now call interfaith leaders starts an organization called the NCCJ, the National Conference for Christians and Jews, and they start running a set of interfaith activities across the country, and as a part of that, they start to extract a narrative that they call Judeo-Christian America. It is literally an invention. And, and as a, the, the most important thing that happens along that path is during World War II, on uh, a US naval vessel that's hit by a German torpedo, two Protestant ministers, a Catholic priest, a Jewish rabbi, who are the chaplains on this vessel, give up their life jackets, give them to the soldiers on this vessel, hold hands, say the prayers of their own fates, jump into the ocean together. The NCCJ recognizes not only the depth of their sacrifice, but the potency of that narrative, calls it the Four Chaplains Initiative, says this is the embodiment of the new Judeo-Christian America. The point is that it is because of the series of activities, particularly emblematic ones, that we then get a national narrative that serves us reasonably well for 60 or 70 years, right? I mean, IFYC and our kind of modest, what's the next chapter of American history approaches, okay, now that we live in a country where there are twice as many Buddhists and Muslims as Episcopalians, what does the next civil religion narrative look like, mm -hmm. right? But I think that that can be extracted from, you have had an experience with a Muslim doctor. That person was a healer in your life. What does that mean for an America that now contains lots of Muslim doctors, for example? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can see I'm at least trying hard at this. No, well, and I mean, I, I'm being absolutely genuine <clears throat> when I say all the more reason why the work you're doing is so important because the storytelling challenge is a lot harder today than it was 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. We've always had the partisan news and we've always had echo chambers. We haven't had the diffuseness of it before, and we haven't had the frequency of it. So I, I mean, I think about when I was growing up, I got the news probably twice a day. I'm not that old, but twice a day, right, where I would read the paper in the, the Colorado Springs Gazette in the morning and watch the local news at night if I was home from school in time, so twice a day. And now I'm checking, you know, every three minutes for the latest updates, and I know that most of you are too, and all around the country this is happening, and people are just reinforcing their priors over and over again 60 times a day. So how do you cut into that narrative and scale these stories? I mean, it's, I think it's urgent, and I'm glad you're doing it, but the challenges are, are immense, right? Not insurmountable, but immense. Yeah, thank you. One last question for me, and, and then we'll grab a couple of questions from other folks who are here. Um, but one area where, where we do have some overlap certainly is uh, that IFYC's work um, is exclusively in higher education and on college campuses and with college students. And, and John, in the book, you use a number of cases that take place on college campuses to illustrate some of your points. So in short, to both of you, why is higher education so important to this conversation? Yeah, you wanna start? No, you start. Well, <laughs> nice move, by the way. What's that? Thank nice you, move, you yeah. asked me, you asked. <laughs> I was on a panel two weeks ago with Mike Gersten and he said, in response to the a question, I have really strong passionate views on this, but I'll defer to John first. <laughs> um, uh, so hi, why higher ed? Well, I think in its best, I think higher ed has to be one of the institutions where the kinds of stuff we're talking about can happen. Now, it don't, does not always live up to those expectations, but when you think about the kinds of dialogues we're supposed to be having in higher ed, the classroom opportunity, the tremendous accumulation of intellectual and financial resources to bring people together. The, in the four-year residential model, bringing students together for four years of living in proximity, of sharing life in a very rich and robust way that most of them will never experience again in that sense. Uh, and, the, and the ability and the, the luxury of time to think about the deepest questions of why we're here, of human existence, of of why we're different and, and why those differences matter. I think what a, what a moment and an opportunity, but also what an area that needs so much care and attention to keep those possibilities open. 
So this is admittedly a softball, right? Because IFYC works in higher ed. So we have a theory of this particular case, right? Uh, so I think there's a set of things. I was just telling Lynn um, that there's a, one of my favorite lines is, uh, how do you build a great city, build a great university, and wait 100 years, mm -hmm. right? And there's, there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. So what is it that US residential higher ed does really well, right? Um, one is it, it is able to think long thoughts. That is, you know, you and I are teaching a course together next semester at Washington University. The reason that I keep on sending you syllabi ideas. <laughs> three times a day. Three times a day. <laughs> yeah, geeked them to the nth degree is because honestly, I crave the ability to mm. think long thoughts. Mm -hmm. I, you know, the, what does it look like over the course of 15 weeks to explore a set of big ideas. And our course is actually viewed, it's, it's viewed as a narrow course, mm -hmm. you know, religion, diversity, and the university, right? But if, if you want to build a civilization, you have to think long thoughts. You can't do that when you have to, you have to do quarterly reports all the time, right? That doesn't mean that those institutions that do that aren't important. It's just that the United States is stunningly fortunate in that we have a sector that is effectively set aside and think long thoughts here, scientifically, philosophically. So that's one thing, right? The second thing is higher education sets civic priorities for the rest of the society. So service learning becomes important in high schools and in companies in part because higher ed decides it's important in the 1980s. And so part of what higher ed can do is to say, hey, we've decided this is important. We're going to get our students to do this. We're going to give them credit or you know, some other incentive to do it. And by the way, if you want to come to our institution, you're going to have to do some of this in high school. All of a sudden, it becomes a priority in high schools, right? And as a bunch of 16 and 18 and 21-year-olds are doing it, they're mm -hmm. talking to their parents about this. All of a sudden, it becomes important in companies. Higher ed helped to set that civic priority. By the way, higher ed does this around race and gender as well, right? Title IX is part of the <coughs> Higher Ed Act in the early 1970s. So the notion of gender equality, Congress gives it to American higher education to effectively pilot and experiment with, right? Of course, it's also no small thing that we have a, a, a group of, of 17 to 21 year olds in higher ed who are asking the question, who am I going to be in the world? And many, 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 many of them get the first inklings, if not the long-term answer, at 19 in John and Azu's course. Oh, you know, I, I didn't know that I wanted to be this kind of lawyer, but in this course I'm learning that, right? So if you want a generation of environmentalists or social entrepreneurs, or in our case, interfaith leaders, having a profound impact in higher ed so that some dozens of them on any campus think to themselves, my gosh, this has been in my heart the whole time, right? This idea, I've always had friends from different religious traditions. It's always really affected me when religious prejudice has been in the culture. But I didn't know that you could put this thing called interfaith vision plus interfaith knowledge base, base, base plus interfaith skill set together and be this thing called an interfaith leader who actually advances this great story of American pluralism, right? Mm -hmm. so, so people get that, and then they do it for the next 50 years. I mean, I tell people all the time, you know, uh, they'll say, so what are the 18-year-olds in college doing? And I'm like, look, we're happy to tell you what our 18-year-olds are doing, but don't judge IFYC by what our 18-year-olds are doing now. Judge them by what they do when they're 30 in their early 30s like Yusra, right? When you, when, when you go to DePaul and you, you take a course in interfaith studies and then you wind up at the State Department advancing that in Sean Casey's shop, that's generational change, right? So that's, I mean, there's a reason Andy Dalbanco, whose book hopefully we'll be teaching in our course, he opens his book College by saying, you know, of all the things that we think of as jewels of American civilization, jazz and baseball and national parks, the American campus is right up there, mm. right? That it, is, it is a jewel of our civilization to have created a network of residential four-year higher ed. How do, we, how do we continue that? How does, it, how does it get put to the highest use? And how can more people from more backgrounds be a part of it? You know, one just quick addendum to what you said, you, you, implicit in your comments was the importance of place to these institutions. And one of the things I love about what you all do is you don't have a click here for the program on your website, but you go to places and get to know their individual cultures. And that matters so much because 
the University of Alabama is going to face a different set of challenges about religious pluralism than UCLA, right? And, and if you don't know that from the get-go, you're not going to be successful. I think right up there, Washington University in St. Louis, and the in St. Louis means something. And sometimes I want to call it Washington University near Ferguson, right? And that should matter too. Uh, so place matters, and culture within place matters, and the, the project of interfaith leadership and religious pluralism will only work when it, uh, to back to your point, when it starts at the local and it, with the granular understanding of who is actually in the room. Thank you. I'd love to bring another voice or two into the conversation. I think we have a microphone somewhere, a microphone over here with Prana. Uh, who has a question that you'd like to pose to Ibu and John? Thank you very much. I wonder if you could share with us a little bit more specifically what the vision would be or what your vision is for America as maybe the first multicultural democracy that has been able to sustain itself for more than a short period of time. There may be other historical examples which could inspire us, which I'd be interested in hearing of. But, uh, but we're at a point in which many of our uh, communities and our experiences in life are quite siloed, and the internet may actually reinforce some of that narrowness. At the same time, what you're referring to as pluralism today encompasses many more groups, religiously and ethnically and racially, than we probably would have thought of pluralism in the 1940s, which puts additional demands on it. So what's a vision for America in the next decade or two that could make us a uh, city on the hill? I'm going to defer to you, Eva. Oh, you are? <laughs> Good work. Um, so I will try to be brief, but I, I, just, I just wrote a book. John and I actually just wrote a book on this together. So uh, um, we wrote a book? this is the Mellon book. Oh, we yeah, did. Yes, we did. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was a, a moment or if you just have so many books in the hopper that you forget. The collaboration uh, was very memorable. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. I, clearly. Um, so I am... I'm on the South Lawn of the White House in fall of 2015, waving a flag of the Vatican, watching uh, Barack Obama introduce Pope Francis, thinking to myself, this is precisely the image that people for 300 years on the American continent warned others of. <laughs> Literally, right? In, in 1630, that, you know, that great early settler, John Winthrop, sailed across the uh, Atlantic on the Arabella, didn't just talk about a city on a hill, said he was going to build a bulwark against the Antichrist, the Pope. And at that time, in October 2010, I don't know if there were a dozen Americans in the country who remember that. Which is to say that as deep as anti-Catholicism went in the American psyche, and it went very, very, very deep, right? Ask the Kennedy family. It has just about been expunged. We live at a time in the early 2010s when the entire line of presidential succession was Catholic. The vice president, the secretary of state, the speaker of the house and you had six of nine Supreme Court justices who were Catholic. This is literally the nightmare that people in the 19th century wrote about, right? And not that many people freaked out. The point that I want to make is that it is very interesting how a set of earlier religious prejudices have been at the very least dramatically shrunk. Now, I think that there are more stubborn prejudices in American life that have not shrunk as much. In the area of religious diversity, I think that there is a really generally positive story to tell on how 
the, the, the succeeding, the successive chapters of American history have increased interfaith cooperation and reduced religious prejudice. I think the question is what is the next chapter look like, but I think that there's a good story we connect to. One of the things I like to think about is, you know, my dad owned a gas station in rural Illinois for about a decade. And people, as he was going around to banks and city council members, et cetera, and you know, wherever it was, it was off of I-57, people would say, meet my friend Sutherland Patel. And they'd lean forward and be like, don't worry, he went to Notre Dame, right? <laughs> so basically, it was a racist, you know, it was basically, don't worry about his, his, his Muslim beard, his brown skin, and his ethnic name. He's, he went to Notre Dame, which, by the way, when it was founded 175 years ago, was viewed as a den of sedition in America, right? A Trojan horse for popery. I think it's inspiring to think of the various prejudices America has effectively shrunk and the ways in which we have advanced interfaith cooperation and what that looks like into the future. You know, and just one comment on the, the how, or at least the how not to. I think the how is to avoid the loud voices, both left and right, who don't want this, who are actually advocating either literally or by implication for total control or total chaos. And just to say, you know, I think there's actually a wide swath of people who choose to and want to live differently. And, and you're never going to persuade the people at the fringes. And they're going to be loud, and they're going to be dismissive. But to have a confidence in the rest of the people in this country. I mean, I was thinking about this. I was reading the biographies of the people who died in Las Vegas, right? And the, 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 the breadth of people and what they do and what their connections were. And they're all at this concert together. And that's kind of America for a lot of people, right? And I think too often we, at least I, start to live my life based on what I'm reading from the loud mouths on both sides. And that's not, uh, that's, gonna, that's gonna be the, the kind of vision that will derail you from where I think we wanna go. I'm actually gonna move us to, to our conclusion on the final point on our agenda. So uh, thank you for that question. Thanks to both of you so much. It's been great to get just a small taste of what you're each thinking about and what you're thinking about together. Um, it, it does seem that sometimes these ideas that exist uh, in, in theory can be difficult to concretize. And so we want to close today by um, thinking about the interfaith leadership that's happening on the ground. And IFYC would like to do that um, by recognizing the interfaith leaders among us who are alumni of IFYC programs. So could the IFYC alumni who are with us today please stand? Thanks. Um, these folks are teachers and doctors. They are congregational leaders and policymakers, um, and they represent the, uh, a small handful of 1,300 IFYC alumni who are advancing leader, interfaith leadership and building bridges across the country and across the world. IFYC really, really sees these folks as, as the change makers. And as we continue our work, um, we spend lots of energy supporting these folks. By the year 2020, we anticipate having an alumni network of 3,000 folks. Um, we couldn't be more proud of them. And we've asked one of our alumni, Yusra Ghazi, to close us out today. So as Yusra makes her way, Yusra has degrees from DePaul and from Harvard. And as Ibu mentioned, she's now applying her interfaith leadership skills at the US State Department. Um, she's one of three IFYC alums currently employed there. Um, Yusra is one of the first people who taught me about interfaith cooperation and relationships across religious diversity when we worked closely together at IFYC. Um, and she's going to bring our conversation to a close today. Great. Thank you, Katie. Um, many thanks to Katie and to Interfaith Youth Corps for inviting me to be here with you all today. It is a real pleasure to be a part of this gathering. Um, I actually, when I was in college, was an intern at Interfaith Youth Corps right here in Chicago. And at that time, I helped organize an interfaith exchange trip to Amman, Jordan. Um, and the exchange uh, leg of the trip where we took a interfaith youth group from Chicago to Amman happened to occur at the same time as the Eid al-Adha holiday. And I found myself on Eid morning sitting next to a Shia American Muslim from our interfaith youth group and the Sunni Jordanian host family and watched reporting of the execution of Saddam Hussein that was happening on that very same day. 
and we spent the afternoon processing what we'd seen and also talking about our interfaith work both in Jordan and in Chicago. More than just learning about interfaith dialogue on that exchange, it brought me into direct contact with big questions about religion and public life in the Middle East, race relations in the US, American misconceptions about the Arab world, and vice versa. That trip and the hundreds of opportunities I've had since then to do the messy, often multifaceted and multidimensional work of building interfaith cooperation in my communities is one of the reasons why I would go on to study religion and politics in graduate school and pursue policy fellowships to help inform how US government agencies deal with the challenges and opportunities presented to us in this multi-religious America. I, uh, two years ago, began working as a fellow at the US Department of State in the Office of Religion and Global Affairs and got to dig into what this world looks like um, in uh, the world of foreign affairs. And I now serve, um, I work at the Education and Cultural Affairs Bureau at the US Department of State, working to bring in new and innovative approaches, new technologies to help uh, strengthen our traditional uh, mechanisms by which we build mutual understanding between American publics and um, their counterparts overseas. I also, as part of this work, uh, promote religion and peace building in various parts of the world. Uh, that's my day job, and in my spare time, I serve on a couple of interfaith committees in my neighborhood, I nurture interfaith relationships with a small network of very different kinds of friends. Um, and so, Interfaith Youth Corps has equipped me with the skills, knowledge, and experiences to advance interfaith cooperation, as you can see, both in my personal and professional lives. IFYC has connected me to a community of interfaith leaders like all of you who inspire my efforts. This kind of work, not so much at the policy level, but at the ground level, is critical for the future. IFYC is cultivating the leadership skills required for this project across generations through its higher education initiatives. And I consider myself blessed to have had been included in this work as an undergrad over a decade ago, now I'm aging myself, um, and to count myself uh, as a part of the IFYC alumni community today. I was asked to conclude today's proceedings, so I will say by way of closing that I am forever grateful to the dedicated interfaith leaders at Interfaith Youth Corps, to all of you here today, and the many supporters of this organization for inspiring my interfaith journey. As you leave today, I hope you know how important you have been in my life and how critical your efforts are to making interfaith cooperation the norm. Together, I truly believe we can bridge this divide, um, various divides in this American moment. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.